God uses small things to accomplish great things. We'll learn that lesson next on Let the Bible Speak. From the Churches of Christ, Let the Bible Speak with Evangelist Kevin Presley. Long ago, the ancient people of God returned from years in captivity and began to rebuild the temple that had been destroyed. It wasn't long, though, and that work came to a stop. And consequently, it took years to build the second temple. But a series of visions came to the prophet Zechariah during that time, and one of them is recorded in Zechariah chapter 4, verses 8 through 10, where we read this. Moreover, the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, The hands of Zerubbabel have laid the foundation of this house. His hand shall also finish it. And thou shalt know that the Lord of hosts hath sent me unto you. For who hath despised the day of small things? For they shall rejoice and shall see the plummet in the hand of Zerubbabel with those seven. They are the eyes of the Lord, which run to and fro through the whole earth. Well, this is an interesting prophecy that actually teaches a timeless lesson about God and His work. And I want to consider this question that is posed by Zechariah here, who hath despised the day of small things? Our study today, the day of small things. The psalmist said, through thy precepts I get understanding. The Bible is the revelation of God to man. And you simply can't live for God until you know something about the Word of God. And you may say, well, I want to read and study the Bible, but I don't know where to begin. I feel overwhelmed or I don't understand the Bible. I want to offer you a wonderful way to get acquainted with the Scriptures. You'll learn about some of the most basic and foundational teachings of God's Word and you'll get a better handle on how to read and approach and study the Bible as a whole. Won't you get in touch with us today and ask to be enrolled in the Bible Correspondence Course. It won't cost you a penny, and we'll mail the lessons to your home, and you take your time to read and study through the lessons. I think you'll be surprised how much you'll learn. Israel had been carried away into captivity by the Babylonians and spent 70 long years there. 
and the glorious temple of Solomon had been destroyed. But now more than a half century later, Israel begins to return home. And as you might imagine, there was a lot of excitement as Zerubbabel led the first wave of nearly 50,000 Jews back to Jerusalem. Now there was a lot of work to do because Jerusalem had been utterly destroyed. It had been laid waste. And one of the first things they did was to resume the worship of God, and they did that immediately. The next year, work began on laying the foundation of a new temple. Now, there were mixed emotions among the Jews about that. The old men who remembered the beautiful temple of Solomon, well, they actually wept, the Bible tells us, because as they built this temple, it paled in comparison. It was nothing like the glorious temple of Solomon. But nonetheless, Ezra tells us in his prophecy that others shouted for joy to see work on the temple get underway. But of course, there are always people there to discourage the work of God, and you'll find that even today, and it was no different back then. Eventually, the people who were opposed to the construction of the temple, uh, they got a government order to stop the work. And so the people instead started working on settling back into their homes and uh, building their own houses and farms and so forth. So the foundation that they had started for the temple, it just sat there for about 14 years. Well, then came the prophet Haggai. Now Haggai preached and got the people all stirred up and started back to work on the temple. But it just wasn't the same. They worked about a month and they realized they were short on resources and no matter what they did, the new temple just would not measure up to the glory of Solomon's temple that had been destroyed nearly a century before. It was very demoralizing. And you know, the Jews were hated. Uh, they have been beaten down. Their land is still in ruins. Their wealth was plundered and gone. And only a small portion of their population even returned to Jerusalem. They're working, but the problems are great. And they just don't have the wherewithal to put things back like they were. Well, about that same time, the prophet Zechariah comes along and he begins to prophesy. And he has a series of visions. And in this one recorded in Zechariah chapter 4, verses 9 and 10, the word of the Lord comes to him and says, The hands of Zerubbabel have laid the foundation of this house. His hands shall also finish it. And thou shalt know that the Lord of hosts hath sent me unto you. For who hath despised the day of small things? Now, do you know what God is saying in that? He was telling these people not to be discouraged over their circumstance. Uh, the temple that their fathers built was constructed, of course, using the enormous fortune of Solomon, but now they virtually had nothing. The temple they were building would never rival the first one in that respect. And he, even after Herod the Great renovated it before the birth of Christ, it would not rival Solomon's temple. But you see, there's a wonderful messianic prophecy in what Zechariah is saying here. What he's telling them is that one day the temple would be built and God would fill it with his glory. And what they were building here in Jerusalem was a type it was a shadow of the great and spiritual temple that our Lord Jesus would one day build. You see, it was a picture. It was a picture of the church of Christ. Now keep in mind, the temple was central to Jewish life and it was the ultimate pride of their nation. And while these workers and these people were downhearted and murmuring over their lack of resources and this pitiful temple that they were building by comparison, God is telling them that something far greater was coming. So they may have despised the day of small things, but God, you see, was using those small things for a great, great purpose. Now that's a principle that's seen all throughout the history of God's people. Uh, you know, when God destroyed the world in the great flood of Noah's day, he used one family of eight people to save and replenish the earth. Out of all the people that lived in the antediluvian age, he chose eight people to save the world. 1 Peter 3 and verse 20. Uh, we read about the story of Gideon later on and his army who were sent to war with the Midianites. You remember the story of Gideon? There were more than 100,000 Midianites 
And God ended up only letting Gideon put together an army of 300 men to fight them. And he didn't even give them any weapons. Now that's a thrilling story in the book of Judges, the sixth chapter. God used an ingenious plan to trick the more than 100,000 Midianites using just 300 Jews armed with nothing but torches and their loud voices. And go back and study that story. That little ragtag army ended up sending those strapping Midianite soldiers running into the night, screaming like children and running into each other's swords. And then later in 2 Chronicles chapter 20, we read about King Jehoshaphat and how he got word that a vast army of the Moabites and the Ammonites were coming to wage war with him. Now, he didn't have much of an army and he was alarmed. And so he asked the Lord what to do and he declared that Israel fast and pray. And in verse 12, it says, Our God, will you not judge them? For we have no power to face this vast army that is attacking us. We don't know what to do, but our eyes are on you, and we're trusting you, Lord. Well, God dispatched the Holy Spirit to Jehoshaphat with this message in verse 15. He said, Hearken ye, all Judah, and ye inhabitants of Jerusalem, and thou King Jehoshaphat. Thus saith the Lord unto you, Be not afraid, nor dismayed by reason of this great multitude. For the battle is not yours, but God's. In other words, God's going to win this battle for you, and the size of your army doesn't matter. Because you see, God does great things with small things. Isaiah said in Isaiah chapter 30 and verse 32, Woe to them that go down to Egypt for help and stay on horses and trust in chariots because they are many and in horsemen because they are very strong. But they look not unto the Holy One of Israel, neither seek the Lord. What does he mean in that? Well, horses and chariots were great uh, tools and resources and implements in war that were used by mighty armies. And Israel... Uh, had a tendency, if they weren't careful, to try to trust in those things. And when they did, they were defeated. Uh, the armies around them were larger, more powerful, more well-equipped than the Israelites. When they won, it wasn't because they were trusting in horses and chariots and the weapons, whatever they might have been at the time that God placed in their hands. They won because God was on their side. Now, they were strong not because of their implements of war. They were strong because of their heavenly captain. Now, what does that have to do with us today? You know, we're not fighting any literal battles like the nation of Israel had to do way back then. Uh, God's kingdom today is not a nation or a literal kingdom like the kingdom of Israel was. God's economy has changed in that and other regards. But there's a great application of that principle because in a spiritual sense, it is yet a day of small things. And, you know, there are many people who consequently despise it. That is, they discount the work of God because it appears to the world to be small and insignificant. You know, sometimes people, and I hate to tell you even religious people, they make fun of God's way. They make fun of God's plan of salvation or they ridicule the church. Uh, they may not think that they're doing so, but really by their arguments, they do. They mock the simple and scriptural worship of the New Testament church. They deride righteousness and holy living. Uh, some refuse to accept the tenets of primitive New Testament Christianity because, well, it's too simple, too primitive, too narrow, too dogmatic, too exclusive, and not acceptable to the worldly, educated, and affluent crowd. In fact, you might say they're ashamed of it. Uh, they think the church has to be something flashy, showy, that we have to make it relevant to the carnal and worldly-minded people of our day, that we have to make it impressive and palatable to the pagan culture around us. And that's why you have a lot of so-called churches today that are more like a nightclub than a place of worship. You know, the Apostle Paul wrote to a church that was situated in a place like that, an affluent educated, arrogant, sensually wicked city, uh, the church in the city of Corinth. Now, Corinth was in many respects like our present culture. Uh, those people 
consequently some in the church, looked down on Paul, and they despised what he preached because it was below them. Now, all of God's Word is, of course, as fresh as a morning dewdrop, but the fact of the matter is the book of 1 Corinthians especially is very applicable to our age today. You know, sometimes we get to saying, well, you know, the world is just a rotten, wicked place and it's getting worse by the day. Well, the Bible does say evil men will wax worse and worse. That is true. Uh, but really, our modern culture doesn't have anything that they didn't have in Corinth. Uh, Corinth was a very wicked, wicked city. And the result of their lifestyle and the result of their mindset and how that pagan culture even influenced people in the church who had come out of sin and obeyed the gospel, uh, they still had the influences of the culture out of which they came. And it was very tempting to them to see the gospel as foolishness, much like a lot of people today do. Uh, well, you know, the gospel in their mind, it couldn't be right because someone as great as God wouldn't inspire a man to preach something so simple and so crude well, listen to how Paul answered them in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, beginning in verse 25. Paul there says, Because the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. For ye see your calling, brethren, how that not many wise men after the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called. But God hath chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise, and God hath chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty and base things of the world and things which are despised hath God chosen, yea, and things which are not to bring to naught things that are. Now, why would God do that? Well, he says in verse 29, that no flesh should glory in his presence. God, in other words, shows his strength by using our weakness. Our great and awesome God is found in the little things of life. Allow me to ask you some questions. Do you attend a church congregation perhaps because of its size? Is that a big influential factor in your choice of where you go and assemble to worship? Oh, people say it must be right because look at all of the people that it attracts. Friend, Jesus said in Matthew 7, 13 and 14, Enter ye in at the narrow gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction. Many there be that go in thereat. But straight is the gate, and narrow is the way which leadeth unto life, and few there be that find it. I remind you that Noah, he was in the overwhelming minority when he went into the ark, but he was certainly in the majority when he came out of it. Or, or do you attend a church congregation because of the kind of people it attracts? Not just the number, but the kind of people it attracts. Oh, there are doctors and professors and lawyers and noble people. And you know, sometimes that thought process even becomes a little subconscious. And we get to thinking, well, you know, those people down in that little church in the country or on the corner, they don't amount to much. They can't be right. Uh, why, look at all of the successful and smart and educated and affluent people that attend here at the First Church of so-and-so. Or look at all of these culturally sophisticated and relevant people that attend this new cutting-edge church downtown. Surely that's what's right. But again, remember, Paul said, Not many wise men after the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called. But God hath chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. You know, the experts of Noah's day scoffed and ridiculed him because of his doom and gloom predictions of rain and a flood. His boat that he was building looked ridiculous to them, and his theology backwoods and unbelievable. But that's not what they were saying when God shut the door of the ark, and the fountains of the deep were broken up, and the windows of heaven were open. Maybe you attend a congregation because of its flashy and titillating worship. The strobe lights and fog machines and rock bands and coffee cafes and daycares and so on. That's the appeal. This must be where Jesus is because look at all of the excitement and look at all of the outpouring of emotion. I remind you that Jesus said to a woman one time at a well, you don't even know who you worship. 
The hour is coming and now is when the true worshiper shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth, for the Father seeketh such to worship Him. God is a spirit, and they that worship Him must worship Him in spirit and in truth. But you see, a cappella singing, it isn't enough. That's not exciting. But yet, that's the kind of singing the early church offered in their worship to God, Ephesians 5 and 19, Colossians 3 and 16. Simple and plain gospel preaching that convicts and instructs and edifies. Well, that's a bore. It's outdated. It's irrelevant. Yet Paul said in 1 Corinthians 1 and 18, the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness, but unto us which are saved, it is the power of God. Uh, you know, the simple observance of the Lord's Supper with one loaf of unleavened bread and a cup of fruit of the vine, that's base or even gross even though Jesus said when he used those very symbols as he instituted the sacred feast with his disciple, this do in remembrance of me. Or maybe you attend a congregation because of their large, impressive building or facility. I mean, God must be in it because it took millions to build it. But yet Paul said, God dwelleth not in temples made with men's hands, Acts 17 and verse 24. And on we could go. A friend, don't despise the day of small things. You know, the Apostle Paul said something that thrills me in the fifth chapter of the book of Ephesians, beginning in verse 25. Paul there says, Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word that he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. The church of Christ is a glorious thing, Paul says. But you see, its glory is not found in the size of its crowd. In fact, God is more likely to be found in a small handful of humble people than in a crowd of thousands of worldly, unsanctified, even though religious people. The glory of the church is not the social status of its crowd. Most of Jesus' disciples were common and poor people even. Uh, it's not in the size and opulence of its building. Many first century congregations met in homes or even in places of hiding. The glory of the church isn't found in any other standard or worldly measurement. The glory of Christ's church is found in Christ Jesus himself and in his truth, which that church believes and follows. You know, Elijah the prophet learned that lesson in a dramatic way. Do you remember what happened to him in 1 Kings chapter 19, verses 11 through 13? The Bible there says, And he said, Go forth and stand upon the mount before the Lord, and behold, the Lord passed by. And a great and strong wind rent the mountains and break in pieces the rocks before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind. And after the wind, an earthquake. But the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, a fire. But the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, a still, small voice. And it was so when Elijah heard it that he wrapped his face in his mantle and he went out. He went out and stood in the entering in of the cave. Now, the point of this is not about literal voices. God speaks to us through his word today, not through inner voices and so forth. But the principle is that God is not found in the things that most people think that he would be found in. You know, for some reason, we always look for the big things, the big crowds, the big ministries, the big deeds with big impacts. But the religion of Christ, if you'll look a little closer at the New Testament, is a religion of small things. One cup of cold water given in his name. Two mites thrown into the temple treasury by a poor widow. A simple chat with one Samaritan woman at a well. A couple of loaves and a few fish. Small things. But here's the thing. As we have so often sung, little is much when God is in it. My friend, despise not the day of small things.
The psalmist said, through thy precepts I get understanding. The Bible is the revelation of God to man. And you simply can't live for God until you know something about the Word of God. And you may say, well, I want to read and study the Bible, but I don't know where to begin. I feel overwhelmed or I don't understand the Bible. I want to offer you a wonderful way to get acquainted with the Scriptures. You'll learn about some of the most basic and foundational teachings of God's Word and you'll get a better handle on how to read and approach and study the Bible as a whole. Won't you get in touch with us today and ask to be enrolled in the Bible Correspondence Course. It won't cost you a penny and we'll mail the lessons to your home and you take your time to read and study through the lessons. I think you'll be surprised how much you'll learn. Well, our time is pretty well gone today. If you'd like to go back and revisit the things that we've talked about and you would like a free printed transcript of the lesson, won't you get in touch with us? We'll give you an address in just a moment if you'll have a pencil ready. You can also go to our website, letthebiblespeak.tv. And don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel. You can go back and watch past broadcasts of Let the Bible Speak. And also follow us on Facebook and Twitter. And we hope you'll tell somebody else about Let the Bible Speak in the week to come. And also, I hope you'll plan to pay a visit to one of the congregations of the Church of Christ that brings you this program from week to week. They would love to have you as they gather for worship today. And we'll give you the information about a congregation close to you in just a moment. Thanks again for being here. Hope you have a wonderful week. And the Lord willing, I'll meet you back here next time, the same time, same place, for Let the Bible Speak. Let the Bible Speak is brought to you by your friends in the Churches of Christ.